Hey there, SM. A function can accept a number, a string, a boolean, an array, or an object. And as we talked about in a previous video, it can also accept another function as its argument. Now, this function that we pass into another function is known as a callback function in JavaScript. And callback functions exist everywhere in JavaScript. I'm pretty sure you have seen it before. Just a quick example, if I add a click event listener to my Windows object, the function here that handles the event is a callback function. Why? Because we're passing this function as an argument to the add event listener function. And our function here will eventually execute by the add event listener function somewhere down the track. Now, let's talk about why do we need callback function in the first place. The main reason why we need a callback function is because it allows the end user to customize the logic and offers a lot of flexibility. Let's use the add event listener function as an example. The author of the add event listener function doesn't really know what you want to do when you click on an element. He can't write the logic for you, can he? Because he doesn't even know how would your website look like. And this is exactly where callback functions comes into the picture. By using callback function, we as the user can decide what to do when an element is being clicked. Now let's make this concrete. We'll be looking at how callback functions work behind the scene. Now suppose I want to do some shopping. Let's create a function for that. Our shopping function will accept one argument, the budget for our shopping. And let's say we spend $100 in our shopping trip. So our budget now will be equal to budget minus spent. And the result of this function will be the remaining budget. So far, so good. However, right now, the user who used this shopping function might want to do something after the shopping. And they don't really have the flexibility to do anything because of the way how we structure our code at the moment. So what should we do then? The answer is to introduce the callback function. So let's create a second argument for our shopping function. And I'll call it after shopping callback. So this argument will be a function that is defined by the user. And we'll run this function right before the return statement. And now let's try to use our shopping function. We'll call shopping and the budget will be $1,000. And for the second argument, we should pass in a function. And let's say after we finish shopping, we'll go and watch a movie. So I'll just console log watch movie. Let's test our code. And now in the browser, we can see watch movie in the console. Let's break it down for one more time. So we pass in a function as the second argument of shopping. And now this function becomes the after shopping callback. And within the shopping function, we're calling this function right before the return statement. And that's where our custom function get executed. Okay, moving on. Suppose the activity that we want to do after the shopping is dependent on the budget remaining from our shopping. Right now, there's no way for us to access the budget remaining from our shopping trip. So why don't we pass our budget to the callback function just like the other functions? So now that means back in our callback function definition down here, we should receive an argument which represents the budget. And just like the other functions, you can name the argument to anything you like. I'm just going to name it budget to keep things consistent. And now if we console our budget, we would expect to see $900. And there you go. If we compare our shopping function against the add event listener function, can you see how similar they are? And this is exactly what's happening behind the scene in every callback function. Let's finish off our shopping function. Let's say the movie cost us $30. We'll deduct the budget by $30 and return the remaining budget as the result of our callback function. In other words, the callback function will give us back whatever is remaining after the activity. So back in our shopping function, we can reset budget to the return value of the after shopping callback. And now if we set the result of our shopping function to a variable and we console log it out, we'll see the leftover after everything. And that's how some callback functions requires you to specify a return value because it needs to use that return value to do something. Okay, now there's one last thing before we end the lesson. There's a concept called callback hell in JavaScript. What that means is we're nesting callbacks after callbacks inside callbacks. If you have no idea on what am I talking about, take a look at this. Let's say we go for shopping again. Our budget is still $1,000. And inside the callback function, suppose we want to do another round of shopping after the first shopping trip. So we're going to call the shopping function again. And let's say after the second round of shopping, we're still not satisfied because we're a bunch of shopaholics. So we go for a third round and a fourth round and on and on and on. Can you see where this is leading us to? Not a shopping mall, but towards callback hell. This code here is very, very ugly and definitely not something that we want to do. There is a solution for this and it is called promise, which we'll be talking more about it in the next lesson. Key takeaway for this lesson, callback is a function that is passed to another function. 
The idea of callback function is to allow the end user to customize the logic of a function. Callback hell is not pretty. It is very hard to read and also to debug. We should try to avoid it as much as possible. That's it for this lesson, and I will see you again in the next video. If you enjoyed the content of this video, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and the bell icon for more content to come. It will really help me out. Thanks for the support.